Give us the investment proposition for tech right now in this age of the pandemic. Well, uh, as I always say, that I, innovation tends to gain traction during times of crisis. Uh, it gains market share at a much more rapid rate than uh, would normally be the case. And we're hearing many of our, uh, the companies uh, uh, that we follow saying that it's almost as though we've compressed three years of technology progress into three months. Uh, we're, we're seeing that in real estate with Zillow and Redfin. Uh, we're seeing it in education with 2U. We're seeing it with some of the infrastructure providers. The obvious plays here, are, of course, Netflix and Amazon. Retail online is, is going to gain much more share here. But the infrastructure providers uh, are, are, are some of the, the stocks that have had massive moves this week, like Twilio. Uh, we're seeing it with 3D printing, uh, uh, spare parts uh, uh, for short, to satisfy shortages. Uh, we're seeing it with collaborative robots for social distancing. Um, across the board, we're seeing companies saying, you know, this crisis is a, a horrible thing for, for our country and for the world, yes. But in terms of catapulting innovation forward, uh, this crisis is doing just that. Kathy, is it more or less affecting tech overall? Is this sort of an ETF play, if you will, or is there some dispersion? Uh, for example, we hear a lot about big tech, what about small tech, or are there other sorts of dispersion differences within the tech sector? It's been interesting to watch small caps. They have underperformed, uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with financial resources and fears about the future. Are we going to get, will they have enough uh, in the way of resources to get from here to there? So that might be a, a part of the problem. Our, our small cap, com smaller cap companies seem to uh, actually be picking up here uh, because I think uh, investors are looking at the, the bigger infrastructure players and saying, and they're soaring, and they're saying, what else is out there? Uh, what other companies are problem solvers out there? So we are now beginning to see the smaller cap uh, names uh, pick up. And uh, that's also confidence building in a way because I think the fear, okay, the smaller companies are gonna have a tougher time uh, getting through uh, this difficult period. Uh, the fact that they're now picking up, I think is uh, confidence building, not only for us in terms of our portfolios, but I think generally, uh, I think there's, light at the end of the tunnel. We're hearing that from a lot of companies. Uh, Kathy, we've talked to you in the past about Tesla, a stock that you have liked quite a bit. We just yeah. heard from GM's CFO, Divya Saradavara, that they're not backing off an investment in EV. How does this pandemic leave Tesla? Well, uh, a lot of uh, investors are wondering if the severe decline in oil prices will disadvantage Tesla. And, uh, and the stock was a, a little uh, tentative for a while there. Uh, however, uh, according to our analysis, our research, uh, the total cost of ownership of an electric vehicle, especially a, a Tesla, is lower than that of a gas powered vehicle if you give it three years. And the, the most important variable there is the trade-in value for cars. Tesla's trade-in values, its residual values, are holding up much better uh, than the residual values or the trade-in values for cars. 90% for gas-powered cars. 90% of all cars, new car purchases, involve a used car. And what's happening here with Hertz and uh, Avis is they are in such financial difficulty that they have been forced to sell some of their fleets into the used car market. So the used car prices have started dropping at an accelerating rate, which means that the residual values of cars or the trade-in values are dropping uh, accordingly. So that, that the residual value going down that much is actually a plus for Tesla, whose residual values are holding up. And finally, Kathy, give us a thought or two about biotech, because obviously we need a lot of help right now as we try to develop tests, develop vaccines. What's the situation with bi biotech? Yeah, what's been incredible about this period is two areas that have been considered either commoditized or not worthy of investment, vaccines and, and tests, uh, diagnostic tests, 
are suddenly, they've got an incredible umbrella here, a political umbrella. Uh, they used to be punished regularly because of attempts to get uh, uh, drug pricing down, uh, all kinds of healthcare pricing down. But we realize that we've starved uh, and we've left to other countries uh, the, the manufacturing uh, R&D uh, associated with vaccines. That is changing. You've got Moderna out there, just went into phase two trial for COVID-19 today, the most rapid uh, advancement into phase two uh, that any vaccine has enjoyed. You've got Arcturus and Inovio out there, all of these in RNA and DNA uh, vaccine technology. Uh, this has never been done before. Uh, and so the, the budgets now being uh, allocated to vaccines, uh, we haven't seen anything like this for 20 years, since, since SARS, 17 years ago. And then on tests, tests have always been considered a, a commoditized business. That is not true with molecular diagnostic tests, which can be so precise person to person. And so we're now seeing budgets opening up in that realm as well. And the whole genomic revolution, we think, is going to gain more traction because of the COVID virus and uh, the imperative to develop vaccines and tests. Uh, so again, another case in point when innovation is gaining traction during a very tumultuous and unfortunate time.